That's better. So, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Grand Rounds. Um, my name is Tom Ford, and I organise Grand Rounds. Uh, thank you very much for coming. This is the start of a new semester, and I'm relieved to say that I've filled the entire programme already, um, so that takes a lot of stress away from me for the next few weeks. Um, we've got a full programme extending all the way until, I think, the 12th of December, then we take a short break for Christmas, New Year, and then we're back into in, uh, for the sort of Easter semester, as it were, in the New Year. We have no slots filled for that, so if you're sat in the audience thinking that you've got a burning desire to come up here and stand and talk 45 minutes, then please uh, please let me know, and we'll give you a slot in, in Grand Rounds. We try to keep the um, the topics as varied as we can. Uh, there's some very clinical things, there's some more um, organisational things. Um, what we've not had for quite some time is what we have today, which is a talk about innovation, uh, and we're working in partnership uh, with independent companies and, the, and ASP, pulling everything together to try to improve healthcare d um, delivery uh, by, by innovation driven by clinicians. And what, that's what Robert Ray is here to talk to us about today. Um, then there are some embedded videos in all this, and hopefully it'll all work. <laughs> um, uh, if it doesn't, you'll see me nipping up and down to try and fix it. Um, but I've, um, uh, Robert tells me that there's got a few examples of some innovations that have been driven by clinicians that they've been able to take on and turn into reality and to help improve patients out in the field. So uh, thanks so much, Robert. Great, thank, you. <clears throat> thank you for that, Tom. So the last time I was here in this lecture theatre giving a talk a bit like this, we had a grand total of five people in the audience, and two of those didn't count because they had been press-ganged into attending by the organiser who nipped out very quickly, saw two people he knew, and dragged them inside for the best part of an hour. So I'm really relieved today to, that we've got a lot more than five people. We've got more than double that, triple that. So thank you all for coming. I hope this will be useful and uh, inspirational too. Um, as Tom said, my name is Robert Ray. Um, I work for an organisation called Scottish Health Innovations Limited, or SHIL. Usually when I go around health boards giving uh, talks like this... Um, and I do that as a large part of my job. I, I tend to start with a bit of background on Shill, who we are, what we do, when we were set up, how we work, and then sort of finish with a few examples of, of, of things we've done, successes we've had. I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to kind of tell the story backwards. So what I'm going to do instead is tell you three um, stories, if you like, which I hope will be um, inspirational and give you some food for thought. So the bulk of the talk will be these three stories, a showcase of three stories, and then the last five or ten minutes will be me talking about the nitty-gritty of Shill and who we are and what we do. And that way, if you need to leave early, if your pager goes, if you've got somewhere else to be, you can go, but you'll still have heard the, the important bit, the bit that I really want, you to, really want you to hear. So I said I'm going to tell you some stories. These are all stories about people like you, people who work um, in the NHS, people who are part of the provision of healthcare. And it doesn't matter what your role is, you know, you could be a pharmacist, a midwife, a porter, a surgeon, you could, be, you could work in IT, you could work in research. Every one of us in our jobs faces problems every day and we have to solve those problems. Um, that's a part of all jobs. I think arguably it's perhaps even more important in, in healthcare, in the NHS. All of us facing problems every day, all of us solving problems. And the three people, the three stories that I want to share with you are all about people who have faced a problem in their workplace, in their work life, and solved it and come up with a solution. But the difference between them and the vast majority of people who are problem solving is that they didn't just sort of leave it at that and think, oh, well, that's great, I've saved some time, or I've improved patient care, I need to go back and do this other job now or this, this task. They sort of said, oh, hang on a minute. This could actually really make a change. This could make a big difference. If this was shared with, with other people, with other boards, with people in the rest of the world, this could really change things. This could make a big difference to how we um, provide healthcare and, and patient outcomes. So these three stories are all about people who sat up and said, yeah, I want to make this idea happen. I want to bring this idea to life. I, it is important. It is important to me. I'm passionate about this. I want to make a change and improve things. So we'll start with this lady, Gillian um, Taylor. At the time we met her, which was about uh, 2014, she was working as an A&E nurse in NHS Lanarkshire. I can't remember if it was Monklands or Wishaw. It was one of the ones down there. And I say was working, so she's actually doing something else now. And a bit, a bit later, I'll tell you some of the, the, the stuff that she's up to now. 
But she was working in A&E, and she and her colleagues um, hang on, were having a particular, a particular problem uh, with um, weighing people. So people would come into A&E, and particularly people who were immobile, people who'd had um, a stroke or were um, critically injured or um, potentially suffering from sepsis, and you need to get an accurate weight from these people to deliver the accurate drug dosage. And she and her colleagues were really struggling to find a good way to do that. And if you look at what's already available, um, there wasn't a huge amount to choose from. Um, some of the things out there, I mean, you have the sort of scales here at the top right, which are fine if you can stand. You have big kind of clunky hoists, which could be awkward to use, difficult to use. You have trolleys, which have inbuilt scales. Again, expensive, clunky, difficult to use. And she said, well, there's got to be a better way to do it. There's got to be a way we can make this process easier, make it quicker, make it better. So this is what she came to us with. Um, literally a, a piece of A4 paper on which she'd drawn a sketch. And you probably can't tell what it is from here, but this, this was her idea for a, uh, a transfer slide, similar to the ones that you transfer people from beds to trolleys on, but with inbuilt um, weighing ability. And this is all she came to us with. This was the seed of her idea, but that was enough. She didn't just come to us and say, I've got this problem, can you solve it? Or I've got this problem, I don't know what to do. She'd actually thought and thought, well, how can, how can this be improved? What, what, what would be a good idea to try and to, to get around this? So she sketched out her idea for a transfer slide, and she's even drawn in the circles there where she thought some of the load cells could be. And she brought this to us and said, here you go, what can you do with this? What, what sort of um, change can you make with this? How can you bring this to life? And we turned it into this, and the story that I'm going to tell you is really how we went through the process of, of going from her sketching a bit of A4 paper four, four and a half years ago into what is now um, the final product there, which is, uh, which is being sold, which we call the patient transfer scale, or the PTS. And this is a very busy slide. There's a lot of information on it, but it was the easiest way I could, I could think of to, to, to sketch out um, really how, how you start with a, with, a, with a basic simple idea and how you take it all the way through the steps to the end and, and some of the different processes that you um, need to go through to do that I'm not going to go into all of these in a lot of detail but I will pick up on one or two um, and go into them in a bit more detail I think but one of the things that people say when they come to us is, why does it take so long for things to get onto the market? You know, why is it when you've got a new, a new device, a new medical device, or even a new drug as well, why does it take years and years and years to get onto the market? And the reason it takes years and years and years is because you have to go through some or all of these different steps. So... Some work... No. So having brought the sketch to her, one of the things we do first of all is the slide I've already shown you, where we look and see what's already available. Often when people come to us, you know, they have an idea and they think it's, it's the greatest idea in the world, and sometimes it is, but sometimes the idea is only applicable to them in their setting, their health board, their ward, their, their immediate environment, and it's not something that other people experience. So we go, we go back and look and say, well... Is this problem actually a real problem? Is it a widespread problem? Or is this a problem for your, for your locality? And in this case, it did appear that you know, there, there were, it was more than just Gillian and her colleagues that were, that were finding this an issue. So as I said, we looked to see what's already available um, and decided that there was nothing out there that already solved the problem in quite the way that she wanted it to. So the first stage then was really to, to see if this would actually work as a concept, to, to, you know, to get a, a, what we call a proof of concept model working. So typically what we do is we work with design companies to get these kind of proof of concept prototypes made, working, working up and running, and then test them. And that's what we did first of all. So the, the prototyping January to August 2015 there. Um, we then went through the process of trying to protect the idea with, with filing a patent. I'll talk about that a bit more in a, in, in a, a second. But with all of these ideas, trying to get them onto the market, one of the biggest hurdles you face is that eventually you have to try and find a company, a partner, who is willing to 
to manufacture and distribute these. And that can often be the make or break for, any, for anything, getting anything onto the market. And we were fortunate with this one. We actually um, went to uh, a conference, so it was the UK Weighing Federation, and met up with a company called Marsden, who are one of the biggest players in, in medical weighing scales in this country. And they were really interested in this and said, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this. Let's see if we can work together um, and develop this a bit more. So having secured that and having got, got the confidence that we had somebody interested um, potentially, um, we then went on um, to take our proof of concept design and, and see, you know, what do we need to do to get it into a final, final shape for it to be um, released? Um, and a big part of that was, was hosting focus groups. So working with NHS Lanarkshire, we hosted a number of these and we invited people working in A&E, so doctors, nurses, various other people, senior managers, to come around and look at these, spend an hour playing with it, playing with the, with the, with the proof of concept device, saying, is this the sort of thing you would use in your ward? Is this the sort of thing that would fit with you? What sort of tweaks or changes do you think you would make to it? And we hosted a number of those, maybe about an hour, and we're very grateful to the people who came, um, gave them coffee and tea and sandwiches, and got their ideas, and were able to kind of tweak, um, make some of the changes there, to the point of having something that was ready, ready to go and ready to manufacture. At that point then, we go to the bottom left, um, and we do the kind of uh, the less exciting part, which is all the legals, getting the agreements in place um, to allow this idea um, to be manufactured, distributed by, by Marsden. The other big hurdle we've faced, which I'll talk about a bit more in a second, um, is the regulatory side of things. So if you, if you know anything about medical devices, and I'll talk more about it in a second, you'll know that very often there are a lot of regulatory hurdles to go through before you can get it onto the market, a lot of safety checks, a lot of um, testing to make sure it, it's, it's fit and safe, um, fit for purpose. Um, and that was a big hurdle as well that we, we got through. So by this time, we're four years after the initial ideas come to us. We're actually at the point where we have something tooling, um, manufacturable, ready to be made um, until December of last year when we had the final thing and it actually um, went on sale. Um, so that's four years then from the initial concept through to um, the final thing. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about, about you know, the patenting, the regulatory side of things, but I'll just take five minutes just to explain because I know people do um, sometimes find this uh, a bit confusing and wonder why why we need to go through all this sort of stuff. So why do we need patenting? Patenting is something we need because we are inherently distrustful, dishonest, and unscrupulous. Not all of us, and not always. And I know it's a bit of a depressing thing to say, but it is actually true. In the ideal world where we all loved one another and we all trusted one another and we were all one big family, we wouldn't need patent protection because we wouldn't lie, cheat, and steal and, and rip off other people's ideas and go off and make money with them. But unfortunately, that does happen in, in, in this world. So... We need patent protection to protect people's ideas and inventions. And patenting, in essence, is all about protecting your idea, your invention, against someone else stealing it and making money from it. And when you patent something, when you patent protect it, you are, you're doing a trade-off, essentially. You are disclosing to the rest of the world what your idea, what your invention is, and exactly how you make it and manufacture it and, and make it work, whether that is a patient transfer slide or a time machine or whatever it is you think you can get to work. If you have an idea and you think it might be patentable, there's a number of things you, <clears throat> um, you have to look at and, 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 and you know, sort of test. For something to get patent protection, to get legal protection, <clears throat> it has to be novel, so it can't already exist in any form. More important and more difficult than that, it's got to be inventive, <clears throat> so it can't just be um, something that you've cobbled together from existing inventions. It's got, there's got to be a genuine light bulb moment in your head that no one else has thought of before. If your invention is something that you, where you've taken parts from other already known devices and you've read a couple of scientific papers and plugged them all together, that's not inventive. That's not an inventive step, and it would fail at that point. It's got to be industrial applicable um, as well. That's also important for that. So I said the trade-off there. You have to um, have enough information in your application so that somebody who's reasonably skilled can make or work your invention, whatever it is, whether it's a simple little widget type device or whether it's a really high-tech um, gadget. And the trade-off is public disclosure, so the rest of the world will know exactly what your invention is. And patenting isn't always the right way to go. If you think of um, Coca-Cola, for example, 
the reason Coca-Cola is so successful today is because they didn't patent the recipe for it. Because patenting the recipe would have meant they would have to disclose exactly what was in it and exactly how to make it, all the ingredients and all the amounts. And by not doing that, <clears throat> they built up a sort of mystique around it over the years and kept it very secret in a locked vault. And that is part of the reason why Coke is so successful today. With patent protection, they have got protection for 25 years. The rest of the world would have copied it. You'd have multiple versions of Coca-Cola on the market now, some of which may be as good as the real thing or not. The reason why it's, it's, it's important for, for what we're doing is because it provides protection and comfort for companies. So a company's not going to take on an idea and manufacture it necessarily unless they have the protection of knowing that someone else can't come along um, and steal the idea and go off and make a competitive um, rival uh, version of it. So the other thing just to spend a couple of minutes on is, is the regulatory side of things, um, which again was a bit of a hurdle here. Just a couple of slides, and again, I won't spend a lot of time on it because it is quite... Um, it's not the most exciting topic, certainly not for me. Probably you will all have seen um, things that you've bought that have the letters CE written on them, CE mark. Um, if you've got a young family at home or children, if you go home and pick up one of their toys and look at the, the label on it, it will have the letters CE written on it. If you've got um, fireworks or boilers or um, if you go up, up into a lift or an escalator, somewhere on that will have the CE marking on it. And CE marking is something that you need if you want to, to sell something in the European economic area, and it, it provides um, it's a declaration that, that, that your, uh, the thing that you want to sell meets various EU regulations for safety and efficacy. And medical devices are one of the things that have to have a CE mark on them if they're going to be sold or manufactured within, within Europe. Actually, some countries outside of Europe also recognize CE, so Turkey and Australia, um, and also Switzerland, Norway, um, and Iceland as well. But it's something that's quite important for all medical devices to go through this process of getting it CE marked. And it can be quite a difficult, challenging process as well. And it's something that we, we do help um, and guide um, health boards and individuals on. What is a medical device then? Again, this is quite a wordy slide, so I'm not going to go into it in too much detail. But the definition of a medical device is really, is, is really anything that is used um, for diagnosing, preventing, monitoring, treating, um, or alleviation of disease or of handicap. Um, or something that investigates or, or modifies anatomy, so things like um, lateral flow tests for pregnancy or for various diseases or medical devices, anything that controls conception as well. And the important difference there is that they're not, they don't work by pharmacological means, so they're not, they don't involve drugs, they're not drugs, they're not antibody um, therapies, um, and they're not, they don't achieve their effect by metabolic means. So sometimes people come to us with an idea, like the patient transfer slide, and say, is this a medical device or is it not? So in the case of the PTS, yes, it is a medical device because it does fit these criteria. It is used um, partly in the treatment of disease, partly in the diagnosis of disease as well, more, I suppose more probably in the diagnosis and the monitoring as well because you're getting a weight from a patient um, to help in your, your diagnosis there. I've underlined the word software up there as well. Software can be a medical device too. Apps can be medical devices. Um, software platforms can be too. We get a lot of ideas come to us now for apps, and I'll talk a bit about that more towards the end. Um, some of the pitfalls of apps, and an app that somebody actually has developed and is out there as well. What do you do to get a CE mark? Again, it's something we help and guide people through, but in general, you have to identify which EU requirements meet your product. Um, if, it's a, if, it's, if it's something that isn't, that is, uh, I suppose, kind of a high-risk device or something like a, a cardiac pacemaker, something that's going to be implanted and that could potentially affect your whole body, it will have a higher risk profile and a higher C category than something that is um, like the weighing scales, um, which is only there to weigh, to weigh you and doesn't, it's not invasive in any way. Sometimes, um, for the higher risk ones, you have to get your product tested by a notified body. Notified bodies are things like BSI, the British Standards Institute, which has their famous kite mark as well, and there's a few others that will do that. But in general, before you put the letter CE on your product, you know, it's got to be safe and efficacious. It's got to do what you says it does. It's got to be safe to use. And you have to have 
a whole thing called a technical file in place there, which has things like risk assessments in it, and, and basically provides assurance that, um, that your device does what, pe- what you say it will do, and it won't harm people either. So there we are, in a nutshell then, four and a bit years from a bit of paper with a sketch on, through to something that's actually on sale now, um, which is the Marsden uh, PTS slide. So I mentioned at the start, Gillian um, doesn't work for NHS Lanarkshire anymore. She's retired from nursing. She has a young family, and she goes off and spends a lot of time with them, which is good. But the other, um, one of the other things she does now is she actually has a job uh, with Marsden as their clinical consultant, and she spends a lot of time um, travelling the world, um, demoing the patient transfer slide to anyone and everyone. She's had a lot of good press coverage there. Um, there's a couple of um, articles there that have been in the press. She's been nominated for a lot of different awards. I think she was in the finalist for um, Nurse of the Year. Um, she's, she's had various other awards for innovation, and she's, she's developing quite a high profile. And who's actually using the slide then? Well, thanks partly to, to her efforts and also to, to Marsden's um, really fantastic marketing of this. Um, lots of people around the world are using it. So this is Gillian in Auckland, New Zealand, where she went over to, to demo it, um, and they loved it, um, and they, they put an order in. She went to Hong Kong, um, to the various hospitals there, um, the picture there at the bottom left, a uh, trade show in, in Dubai. And her journey has even taken her as far as Scarborough, which is where she was a couple of weeks ago. And again, you can see happy smiley faces. People really like this idea because it's simple to use and it's straightforward. I think last week she was actually in Blackpool as well. So she's done, she's done the runs to the north of England, certainly, um, and of Scotland. So I thought I was being dead clever by embedding my video links um, into this, hoping they would play, um, but they're not going to. So instead, um, I'll just go straight back to the, the YouTube video. <clears throat> and hopefully this will... Uh, play and Gillian can have the last um, word on it Um, even if the sound doesn't work you will still see the images which will show uh, how the patient transfer slide operates I'm Gillian Taylor inventor of the patient transfer scale you can now weigh a mobile patient instantly and accurately simply by using the patient transfer scale in the same way we would use a transfer slide the PTS is a transfer slide that has an inbuilt weighing scale so when you transfer a patient you get an instant accurate weight reading it means weighing is part of the existing process of lateral transfer to no extra stress for patients dignity is maintained time and money is saved and you can administer drug dosages or treatment accurately and safely. Okay, there you go. <clears throat> Communication techniques. Evaluate these two units for different therapeutic techniques and communication videos. Oh, okay. Ensure the patient's response to each and <laughs> Cheers. I thought that's not right somehow. <laughs> Okay, so that was um, Gillian then. So the second story then is um, a, kind of almost like a polar opposite. So this is about Paul Swinton, who's an air ambulance paramedic working for the, the ambulance service. Um, Paul's quite an interesting character. He's from South Africa originally, um, which obviously has a lot better sunnier weather than we do. And that, that comment kind of will, will come into to play a bit later on because it does have a slight bearing on the idea that he had. He's been based in this country for a number of years now um, as a paramedic working in the, uh, the air ambulances. Um, and as you can imagine, that's, that's a pretty stressful, full-on job. You know, you're dealing with, with critical little people in very difficult um, terrains and very difficult circumstances, and it's quite stressful. And one of the things that, that Paul talks about if you ever meet him is cognitive load, so the load on your, your mind and your brain when you're in stressful situations and you're trying to process information quickly to help treat people. So the problem he was facing then was a particular one, which is um, being able to deliver RSI, so rapid sequence intubation, 
um, to critically ill patients in really difficult situations and terrains. And as I said, if you ever meet him, if you ever hear him talk, one of the things he will talk about is his very first day on the job working for the ambulance service. Um, and he was on the air ambulance, and it was going out to a call somewhere in the West Highlands. And um, unlike South Africa, where the sun always shines, it was the middle of winter here. It was cold. It was dark. It was blowing a gale. So they made a landing um, on some pretty rough ground on this hillside, and they had to treat this person who'd fallen. One of the things you have to do if you're going to do this sort of intubation technique is you've got to make sure your kit is all there to start with. So you do what's called a kit dump, and you unpack it, and you lay it all out quickly and carefully, check it off, and then you start to administer the treatment. So he started to do this, and because it was blowing a gale, half of his equipment blew across the side of the hill, and he had to chase after it in the dark, in the rain, pull it all back. All the while, this, person, this, this um, patient is getting worse and worse, and it's adding time and minutes to the treatment process and adding cognitive load and stress to him and to his colleagues. So they were successful. They treated the person, got them back to the hospital, but when he got back, he was thinking, you know, there's got to be a better way to do this. There's got to be an easier way um, that takes off the pressure and takes off the load and saves time in this situation. So as I said, you know, what we look at what's already available, the process for doing a kit dump is basically a clinical waste sack and a template, a paper template, and you unpack all your stuff and you lay it out on this, which is fine if you're in a clean, warm, cosy, dry hospital. It's not fine when you're on a hillside on, or on a motorway attending to a crash and you've got no space to do it in. There are one or two templates out there. You can pull this off, off of the internet. Somebody in the States who just put together a very simple template um, for laying things out, but that's all it is. You would print it out and then forget to use it or forget to pack it. So um, Paul went away, and I'll show the, I'll show the little video in a second, um, and thought, you know, what can we do to solve this problem? Um, and I will show you this, for, again, another very quick one, mm -hmm. uh, which has sound as well. So there's a lot of information in that video, but what I've done is actually just um, cut out the main bit, the main slide from it. And what I wanted to speak about for this particular one is that the challenges with the SCRAM bag, as it's called, so SCRAM is um, Structured Critical Airway Management, are quite different from the, those that we had with the patient transfer slide. So Paul is pretty handy with um, a sewing machine and a needle and thread, and he went away after he'd had his idea and thought, I'm going to build a prototype myself. And sometimes people do that. Sometimes they, do, they don't just come to us with a sketch and a bit of paper. They actually go home and knock something up in their shed or the garage um, or on the sewing machine if they've got one. So he came up with essentially what is P1. So he'd taken a, an ordinary like hold all bag and some needle and thread and some elasticated um, holders, sewed it all together and said, my idea is that you have a bag where you have your kit dump already laid out, where it's all checked and signed. You know everything is in place and it will save you time, minutes, and remove stress from these situations. And we took that bag, and as you'll see going around the outside of this, this slide, um, the bag has gone through a number of different iterations now um, via a design process. So we have P1, which is the first prototype, version two, uh, version one, sorry, version two, another version two. And this process of iterative design is really important sometimes in, in, in a lot of the ideas that we get. 
if you look at the patient transfer slide, that was just one design. It worked with the, with the load cells in the scale the way it was. We didn't need to tweak it or do much with that. This one, as you can imagine, because it's so critical to have things laid out properly, the position of things is really important. But also, uh, there are other factors as well. The material it's made of is important. The textile, it's got to be tough, it's got to be durable, it's got to be um, something you can use um, in the worst of weather as well. And so via this kind of circle in the middle, we go through these, these sort of steps. A lot like with the transfer slide, we had focus groups as well. We, we get a lot of community, we get community feedback. We, we give these prototypes to people to try and evaluate and assess and say, well, is this good enough? Does it work for you? Does it work in your situation? Does it work you know, under a really hot um, desert sun? Does it work under a really cold, wet um, Scottish winter? And by going through this, we, you know, we, we you know, we kind of evaluate, change, tweak, reiterate um, over and over again. Um, and in fact, it's a, it's a continuing process. It's an ongoing process. We're up to version two now. There'll be a version three and a version four as well. So in fact, we have, uh, we have version one here. Paul, being um, the ever-inventive guy he is, has gone away and said, well, that's great, um, but wouldn't it be good if we had a paediatric version as well? Because for children, you need a whole different set of bits of kits, so different size, especially different sizes for the range of um, um, throats. So we have the, the paediatric version too. And then he said, oh, well, hang on, sometimes people don't have the space for a big bag like that or don't want to carry it around, that's a lot. Um, so we now have the... The small version, the little pod. Um, I really, really wanted to call this pea pod because it's pediatric and it's a pod. And I wanted to colour it green, and I thought that would be really cool for branding, and it would sell really well. We had like a little sort of pea pod logo. Um, my colleagues kind of shot that idea down in flames a little bit, um, not least because green is already used in the emergency services to, to specify some other or designate some other kind of, of bag. But it gives you an idea then, you know, of, of this kind of iterative process, you know, you tweak, change, tweak, change, and eventually you get to something that works and works really well. But it doesn't necessarily end there, you know, it can, it can go on um, changing and evolving. So comparing it to the, the patient transfer slide then, in this case, there is no patent protection because it, it's not something that can be patented. Not everything can be patented. I mean, in this case, it's a bag. Bags have been known for a long time. Um, bags with bits of elastic in have been known for a long time. The layout, yes, is, is novel and is inventive and is creative, but that's, enough, that's not enough to get a patent. But patenting isn't always you know, the be-all and end-all. You don't always need a patent to get something onto market necessarily. You can commercialise things without patents very often as easily as with. And there's no need for a CE mark as well either because this isn't a medical device. It doesn't fit any of the rules for medical device. Um, it does need to pass, I think, some, um, some criteria for, for toughness, so something like BSI-type standards, but it's not a, it doesn't need to go through all the hoops and all the, all the hurdles that um, a medical device would um, under MHRA rules. But the contrast then is that the design process was much more important for this one than it was for the transfer slide. As I said, you know, the layout of the interior was really critical. Getting things in exactly the right place was critical. Finding the right construction, the right textiles, and getting the machining right was really important too. And we were lucky that we found a, um, a good commercial partner quite early on, a company called Open House, um, who worked with us on that um, to deliver that and deal that. Um, yeah, so in both cases, finding a commercial partner early really made a big difference to that one. Just as a very slight aside and a quick, a sort of quick slight tangent, design process in healthcare is something that's really critical now. So um, Tom at the start mentioned that you know we're, we're Shill is embedded up here with um, ASP, the Academic Health Science Partnership. One of their focuses and remits is, is really to kind of encourage design um, and, and, and design in healthcare. I mean, design, as you've seen, it's about patient transfer slides and scram bags, but design in healthcare and improving healthcare has other facets too. So things like um, Improving the patient pathway for inpatients, you know, better environment, better support materials, better patient experience. That's a design issue. That's something that, that can be redesigned and re-improved, just in the same way that medical devices um, and, and um, various other bits of kit and tool can be improved. Um, in Scotland, we're, we're fantastically lucky that we have um, Glasgow School of Art and, of course, um, Duncan of Jordanston just along the road there, being two fantastic places that are very hot on product design, process design. 
And in fact, some of the, the, the health boards, I think Tayside, but also Lothian, Ayrshire and Aaron, have worked with GSA on specific projects. So honor students from, from GSA, for example, have worked with Ayrshire and Aaron to design and improve a new patient pathway for um, endoscopic inpatients. And that's everything from redecorating uh, you know, the, the inside of the hospital and providing a better layout and a better walkway route for the, the, the patients to come in to providing better material to them through the post um, prior to their appointment. So, you know, properly colour-coded things, things that information that's easy to digest. So design is really, really coming to the fore now, um, uh, something that's much more important and growing in importance for, for, for all sorts of healthcare. So that was just a little aside there, something that I'm a, um, a little bit passionate about. So I said iterative design. So Scram version 2 is on sale now, um, and you can see it there. There's now a whole suite of things which I've mentioned. I've mentioned paediatric Scram and, and what I call Peapod, um, and there will be various other ones as well. This isn't, this isn't a, 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 you know, a stop. We've got a product, let's sell it. This is a continuing process um, that we're finding. And you can get all of these from, um, from Open House as well. So who's using it then? Um, we've sent a lot of these out to various people to, to trial to see if they're interested in buying it. Um, you can probably tell from this slide with the, the sunlight and the swimming pool and the palm trees that this wasn't taken in Scotland. Um, this is people in Darwin, Australia, using the Scram bag. Um, I think that's the base hospital in Darwin, and they're testing it, and they give us some nice feedback on that. We've given uh, Scram bags to the flying doctors um, and also to their counterparts in the States and Canada, and we're looking to get distribution deals there as well. And the feedback's all been in fantastic so far. People really, really like it. They like the fact that you've got the bag. You rip it open. It's all there. You just go... And if you ever see or hear Paul speak, he will, he will show you lots of graphs. He's quite research-minded, and he will show you graphs of how using the scram bag decreases cognitive load, decreases stress, um, improves the time it takes to, uh, to uh, administer the treatment as well, and saving you like two or three minutes, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're in that sort of situation, it, can be, it feels like hours, and it, it makes, a, makes a huge difference as well. Um, so another video, this is actually six minutes long, but I'm only going to show the first minute or two because that will just give you an idea of how this is used uh, in reality. So that's a quick example then of uh, how it works in practice. Okay. A 
Last one then. So just in case there are any doctors in the audience feeling a bit left out that we don't take ideas from you. Yes, of course we do. We get ideas from doctors, physicians, surgeons of all sorts. This one, um, the gentleman on the right, uh, Dr. Ian Livingston, who's a consultant ophthalmologist, um, lately of Greater Glasgow and Clyde, now NHS Fourth Valley. Next to him is Professor Mario Giardini, who's an um, engineer at University of Strathclyde. Um, sorry, I might go back. Ian's passion is, is very much, obviously, in delivering the best ophthalmic care possible, but also he has a particular interest in um, delivering care over distance, so a kind of telehealth um, approach. And he's been, one of the projects he's been involved in uh, has been uh, one called Peak Vision, which is essentially a project that, that was designed to take um, a smartphone and add a little bit of hardware to it and a little bit of software and turn it into a portable ophthalmoscope with the idea being that you would then use that in really remote to access locations, particularly sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I was really surprised to learn that sub-Saharan Africa actually has much better mobile phone coverage than uh, Europe does, um, simply because of the vast distances um, encountered there and because it's the only way that people have to actually keep in touch most of the time. So it was a really good place for that kind of thing. Um, but obviously in Scotland too, you know, we have remote parts of Scotland, we have uh, the West Highlands, we have the Islands, places where people can be... Um, a long way from, from medical care, medical help, and maybe have to make a two or three or four day round trip to get to the nearest um, hospital, to the nearest ophthalmologist. The idea that, he, um, that Ian had then, which is kind of related to, to, to that, was, was particularly to um, try and engage uh, with children more. So, of course, if you work with children, you know they have a different set of um, needs and demands, and they're not always um, as compliant as adult patients, or maybe sometimes they're more compliant, I don't know. And one of the things that, that Ian does quite regularly is testing of visual acuity in children. And he wanted to find an easier way to do that. The problem he was facing was, was trying to, to find a way to do that and test it um, and make it sort of fun and engaging for children too. So he came up with um, Peekaboo. So Peekaboo is an app. Um, and our involvement in this was fairly light touch. Um, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, which he was working for at the time, has a medical devices unit, which is kind of a, a sort of an arm of the medical physics departments that, that most big hospitals have. And using the, the software and hardware engineer, engineering expertise available there, um, he worked with them to um, design this app and came to us um, fairly late on and came to us really just for the regulatory advice because this app is testing visual acuity. It's a medical device. Um, and at the time, we were... Um, able to do the CE marking for that. because So it's a class 1 CE marked um, medical device. Um, we did a few other things as well. Um, Peekaboo is a registered trademark, um, so we, we, we helped with that. So that's a form of IP protection similar to patenting, um, but it protects the logo and the name in this case. And we are actually sit as the legal manufacturer for Peekaboo for, for, this, for this app. Um, it's, on, so it's on sale. It's actually available free to download. Um, from, from the App Store. And one of the things I wanted to say just about apps in, in passing is apps are great. Everyone has an idea for an app. From a commercial point of view, they're really difficult because they cost a lot of money to develop. I mean, anything from fifty to 250000 to get a prototype app made. And they are almost impossible to monetize and actually sell because most people believe you should be able to download them for free, particularly healthcare ones. So they're really difficult um, to commercialize. Um, and that's why this one is available um, large, for free at the moment. Do you know, for a second there, I actually thought that embedded link was going to work, but it's not. So we'll go to YouTube again. Okay, so the idea then with Peekaboo is that you have this um, you have this app, which uh, I'll just find the right slide. 
you have this app which has these circles on with um, progressively narrowing black and white lines and you have your, your little person in front of you and you invite them to stab at the screen where they think they can see the black and white lines. The lines get narrower and narrower as you go on until eventually you reach the point where you can't see them or can't differentiate them from the other circles on the screen. If you get it right, you get the peekaboo face saying peekaboo and hopefully your little person smiles and is happy and then goes on to the next one. And at the end, it gives you a quantitative readout for visual acuity, which means a lot more to an ophthalmologist than it does uh, to me. So I'll finish then, just the last five minutes, um, with, with the kind of nitty-gritty stuff, then who we are um, and what we do. So we've been around for a while now. We were set up in 2002 um, by NHS Scotland. And as you've seen, you know, what we do is we protect and commercialise ideas from NHS staff. Um, we're a limited company, even though we're set up by NHS Scotland. We're actually a limited company on our own right. We have three owners. Um, NHS Tayside is one of them, Golden Jubilee, National Hospital, which is where we're based in Clydebank, um, and the Scottish Ministers, um, also known as the Chief Scientist Office, is the other owner. We get all our funding from the CSO, so we're not for profit. We don't actually benefit financially from uh, the, the innovations that we Produce. We shave off money for costs. We do a bit of cost recovery, um, but the vast majority of the money goes back to the health board and to the inventor, which I'll, I'll touch on again in a second. Since we um, started, we've actually had about 1,800 ideas come to us now. By no means do we select all of them for, to progress them because we're limited by budget, um, because some of the ideas just won't fly for whatever reason. They're not feasible technologically or commercially. So we select about 10% to progress them. Day to day, what we do, as you'd have seen, you know, we do all the things that I've mentioned in, in those case studies. Um, we evaluate ideas, we find partners, we do prototyping, working with design companies, we work with patent attorneys to protect IP, we find funding routes for the really expensive projects, um, and we try and find a way to, to get these to market in, in some way, whether that is through licensing, as in with Marsden, where we license the idea to Marsden and they produce it. Um, or whether that's a, another way. Sometimes we've founded spin-out companies as well to even do that. The big letter at the bottom, give a return to the NHS. That's what it's all about. It's about NHS boards benefiting financially from the ideas that their staff have. Because if you invent or create something um, during your employment or that's, that's motivated or inspired by your employment, then in general, your employer owns that idea. Um, and that's not just NHS. That's, that's standard UK employment law. But employers recognise that, and the NHS particularly recognises that, and it wants to incentivise people to come forward and share the ideas and, and, and get some benefit from them. So all the health boards have a different sort of um, revenue sharing scheme. So if an idea comes to us and we select it, develop it, commercialise it, sell it, the health board will, of course, get some money, but the inventor gets a cut as well. And this is the... This is the NHS Tayside revenue sharing model. Um, different health boards do it differently. Sometimes it's like a third, a third, a third of the profit. Sometimes it's a sliding scale, as we have here. Um, but Tayside's pretty good. Up to about the first 500k of profit, you know, the inventor would get half. NHS Tayside would get half um, of whatever comes back. And I would never promise that anyone's going to become a millionaire. There have been maybe one, two, three inventors in our history who have done exceptionally well financially out of their ideas. Most don't, but I think no one is ever motivated by money when they come to us. They want to see their idea used and out there and developed and helping people. Um, and a quick final word, if you're a student, you don't have an employment contract, so you own whatever you invent or create, and it belongs to you entirely, and you can do what you like with it. But do come and talk to us, because we can always advise and help. So that's my contact details. I think that's 52 minutes. Um, I have the, the, the scram bags here if anyone wants to have a quick look at them or a, a bit of a play with them. I've got Peekaboo on my tablet. I don't have the transfer slide here because it weighs 11 kilos and I'm just not that strong to carry all that sort of stuff through. But come and have a look if you want to or if you've got any questions, um, I'm happy to take them now as well. And thank you for your attention. All right, oops, I tripped up my scram bag. Um, not a lot of time. Anyone got any burning questions? I'm sure Robert will hang around if you've got anything you want to talk about. Okay. And uh, to, um, So we'll call it to hear that. Uh, Grand Rounds is here every week until the, the week before Christmas. So um, do come again, bring a friend, um, and let people know that this is a, 
exciting, interesting series of lectures that are put on for free for all of you for the whole of, of the semester. So thanks again to Robert, and I'll see you again next week.